So I am going to go ahead and pull up. I believe we have is it Richard who is up next. Yes, Richard Hughes on pass some peer to peer metadata. Let's go ahead and bring you on up here, Richard. I think I see you here. Hi. Welcome. You are live at the release party. Brilliant. Audio works. Yes, I hear you. I see you. Do you see the share screen option down below? Yes. Okay. Let's do. Can I share media? Like, can I? I've got a. Um... I think so. Let's try. Like, oh, you mean like provide the file? Yeah, yeah. I think if I just, I think I need to click present. Ah, uh, yeah. There's this add source. I think we need to approve it or something. Ah, uh, yep. I see it. Here we go. Hey, there we go. That works. Excellent. Okay, brilliant. Right. Thanks for that. I'm gonna go ahead and hop off, but I will be here in the in the little green room if you need anything. But I will go ahead and pass it over to you, Richard. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. So, hello everyone. Um, this is my presentation about Passim. Passim means here, there, and everywhere, um, and it's basically a local caching server, um, which sounds super scary, um, but actually it's super useful. So I guess first a few little details. Um, I've been building open source software for about like, I don't know, 20 years, like way too long, um, 15 of which at Red Hat. And over that time, I built like PackageKit, UPower, GNOME Software, um, sort of other stuff. More recently, FWOPD and LDFS. Um, and with lots of vendors, we've shipped, I think last year it was 100, 109 million firmware updates to end users which is kind of awesome. I'm still having a lot of fun at Red Hat. It's great. But it's my day off, so anyway. Um, so yeah, the basic fact that I'm trying to solve here is that every day, 12 million people download a two megabyte file from the LDFS CDN. Um, two megabytes isn't a lot. Um, in some of the areas where the data is more expensive, it's more maybe a bit bigger issue. But the issue here is we want to scale up. So we want to scale up to rather than having 140 vendors, we want to have a thousand vendors. And at the moment, the LVFS costs like, a, I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars a month to run. And the majority of that is spent on data egress. Um, and there's very good reasons why we can't just use like an existing mirror network, which I'll come to in a minute. And so we need to solve the problem of having 100 million people download a, a two, million, two megabyte file. Um, um, every day. So what can we do about this? Well, if we're clever, we can have one client downloading from the internet um, because everyone downloads the same file. The whole This is designed so that rather than the Microsoft way of doing it, which is the you have your hardware manifest that gets uploaded to Microsoft server, and then you get your list of updates downloaded bespoke. Everyone just downloads the same metadata. And then everything's done client side, works out what firmware we need, and then we request that firmware. And although it means we can compress, we can do clever stuff to compress the metadata down. So we've got thousands and thousands of different firmwares and just two megabytes of blob. It's still coming from the CDN, it's still internet traffic, and it's not free. Like CDN, a Jira applicator CDN isn't expensive, but it is when you have like billions of people using it. Um, so we also want to use less electricity. So actually, weirdly, it, it, it takes way more power to download something from the internet than it does from the computer sitting next to you on the LAN. And if you're on something like 5G, as opposed to Wi-Fi, it uses two orders of magnitude more power to download it. Um, and for a long time, we've obsessed about like how efficient things are because of it makes batteries last longer. And when you start talking about the giant scale of billions of people downloading something, you need to start thinking about how much like carbon you're using, like so one extra megabyte that kind of increases your amount of carbon you're using by 50%. And so it's kind of a big deal. Um, there's other things about metadata which make it interesting. Yesterday's metadata is today's, like say in the UK, chip paper in that it's useless. So metadata that you, you got yesterday is redundant. On the LVFS, we regenerate it every four hours. And so it's not super interesting. So what we can do is we can have one, one machine that downloads from the internet, which then shares it securely to your local network, which sounds really scary, but I'll explain why in a minute. We also don't want one single machine. 
to act as a server, like an impromptu server for the entire department. So if you've got a room full of 500 computers, you don't want the first person who turns their PC on in the morning to grab the file from, from the internet and then to serve that to the entire network. You want to limit how many people are you're allowed to share one file to. So it might be one to five or one to 50. And then it kind of propagates out through your network. Um, now, a lot of people won't like the idea of this. And you know what? That's absolutely fine. This is quite a contentious topic. The fact that your PC might be serving files to other people on your LAN, people that may not be friendly. And there's kind of like four ways of solving this. One is just tell everybody to stop doing passive stuff. Just t PTP policy equals nothing. So we don't share anything at all. But it doesn't stop other clients using PASIM. So you can also mask the service, it's fine. You just basically say to the service, like, this is never allowed to be run from System D, no matter how it started. Or you can just remove it. Like, the, we split out a dash libs package, sub package, which means that the stuff that depends on it depends on the libs package. And if the libs package exists, but the daemon doesn't, well, an error gets returned and the service carries on like normal. And the other thing is, if you are really worried about privacy and this kind of stuff, you probably want to be already blocking DNSSD because at the moment, your printers are generating discovery traffic so that you can see printers on your local network. So if you're worried about this, that huge amount of privacy from the NSSD, you want to block it already. Um, right. So obviously this stuff is security sensitive because we're sharing files to other clients on the network. We don't want like the next worm to go through your intranet. So we have to think about very carefully about what we're doing and the resources we're using and ways we're locking things down, et cetera. So of course we are running an extra daemon that comes with a cost. It takes four megabytes of RSS and it takes about 300 milliseconds of CPU time for a sharing, I don't know, half a dozen files. Um, and another immediate question would be, why don't you just use something existing? Why, don't, why do you recreate something when other stuff exists already like BitTorrent or IPFS. BitTorrent poses a huge problem because any BitTorrent traffic on a network is immediately suspicious from lots of network admins. It's also a very um, heavy library and it's doing things, it's actually trying to, by design, trying to escape your local LAN. So it's trying to connect you on your LAN over the internet to someone else on their LAN. Um, and that's kind of the opposite of what we, what we need to do. So firmware, so metadata itself is fairly safe to share. It's fine. Um, but if you start sharing other things like firmware, um, that it contains strong encryption. And we have um, uh, regulations like ITAR and EAR, which say that you're not allowed to ship that data to countries like Syria and South Sudan and things like that. Otherwise, lots of bad things happen. Um, and so we have to worry about this kind of thing. With IPFS, you can do some of that. And we actually experimented using IPFS for about a year, but it got really expensive because you have to have like an internet IPFS bridge. Um, and also you have to require the users to running a very specific client written in Go, which is actually quite heavyweight. It also takes about three minutes to get a, a, um, a request over IPFS for a specific file using IP, IPNS. Um, and we need responses within about 100 milliseconds. Because if we're using this thing on the CLI, we want to, if we can't get it from IPFS or PASIM or BitTorrent, we need to fall back to the um, kind of upstream kind of direct downloads without the user having to wait six minutes on a progress bar. Okay, so we've got this cool thing. It allows us to share files. Who can download them? Well, by default, you have to have the SHA-256 hash of the thing that you're after. And so what you'd say is you say, right, I need the file that has the SHA-256 hash of this long key. And you ask, using Avahi, you sort of say, hey, who's got this file? And servers on your client, or servers on your network will say, yep, I've got this file. And they return some data. And you just download it off HTTP. Um, like I said earlier, we sort of limit how many times that you can do this um, so that you don't like DOS one machine. Um, and we also limit publishing. So if you want to like put a file onto PassSim so that you share it with your LAN, you have to be the root user. Now we might, I'm not sure, maybe yes or no, we might add some sort of policy kit rule to allow non-root stuff to publish files in PassSim. But at the moment, it's only stuff like FWD, PackageKit D, stuff that's running as CAPSIS admin, UID zero. 
Um, the files themselves get stored somewhere sort of nice and safe and secure um, with without recommission, valid, passim, and we store the uh, data rather than naming a database, we just stick it as an X at a, on the file. Um, and the only thing we have a database for is a like an like a, like a audit log, um, which is kind of useful. So the obvious question is if you can only download via the hash, where do you get the hash from? And uh, that's a really good question. So we don't, I don't want to get into the into the, the business of um, like a zero trust network where you can do this and the other. The easiest thing is just go to the internet, request a hundred bytes of what is the latest hash for today's metadata. So using your existing um, DNS sort of base, sort of certificate pinning or whatever you're using to get the, like what is the SHA-56 of the proper metadata, at, just like you would with a Metalink file. And then you request that. Um, so then the next obvious thing is, what's stopping you have a laptop in your local LAN, which says, yep, I've got that file. And then you return some random binary. Well, yeah, you could do that. That's totally fine. Um, but if you do that, to, to stop you, that, that actually happening, is you have to check some of the data that gets returned from PASIM to make sure. So if you request check some ABC and you get some data back, you need to make sure that that data is actually ABC. Um, on this, you could cause a denial of service doing that, I suppose. But in the same way, you on your client in your local network, you could have um, you could have a, a, like a, a process creating a million printers in the same kind of sort of trouble 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 way. Um, and by if there is a failure, we sort of fall back to um, the HTTP way. So nearly done. So. If you want to debug this stuff and for actually find out what's being shared, there's a website which is hosted, which is only available on localhost, which shows you the files, how many times they've been shared, the size, etc. Um, there's also a command line tool, which is Passim Status, um, which uh, Passim also has publish, publish, unpublish, etc. Um, this shows you how much um, you've saved, um, etc. I guess that's kind of the takeaway here is that when you when you have an internet service that's providing billions and billions of files, it's not free. It's not free from a money point of view, and it's not free from like a carbon electricity point of view either. And so it's kind of our responsibility as developers to make this stuff as efficient as possible, not just for battery life, but from a like a planet resource consumption point of view. It's so kind of my takeaways heart here is we should work out what other type of metadata we can share like ad block metadata seems an obvious one. Maybe repo data is another easy one. You have to be slightly careful sharing too much stuff. Like for instance, one of the things FWP can do, but it's disabled by default, is share the firmware metadata. So the firmware uh, binaries themselves. But if you have a, like a P1 Gen 3 laptop and you download the update and then you immediately share it, people not only know what hardware you've got because you're sharing that file, but they also know that you probably are vulnerable. So if you have a remotely exploitable bug, then you kind of, you're telling people that you're a target. And so the way we've solved this in FWD is when you share the file, you set a flag on it and you say, this flag, this is only valid when I'm running a new version of the firmware and I've rebooted, which sort of solves the package problem as well. We also need to collect some stats, which is really hard because of the preserving people's privacy. But we want to find out whether providing PASIM is um, kind of useful. Like if it's only saving a megabyte per user per year, it's no, there's no point doing it. But if we're saving pentabytes of transfer, then that's like tons of carbon and it's really worth doing. And of course, we need to, stop to keep talking about the privacy and security and all the other things that are really important to all of us, and me included, without sort of scaremongering and sort of saying this is evil because X, Y, Z. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, it, it's, all this feature is in Fedora 40, so play with it now. And fingers crossed the internet traffic does that. I'll also be on the uh, Matrix chat. So if anyone has any questions, queries, worries, let me know or email me, richard.husey.com.
Yeah, we have some time for, for Q&A. So folks, I'm gonna use this fancy little banner here that I have. If you have some questions for Richard, please go ahead and put them in the chat and he can answer them live before we go over to our next session in... Oh, wait, no. This is a this was a fifteen minute one. So actually, yeah, right. I'm happy to answer questions. But <laughs> okay, so we will take those to chat. Actually, I will go ahead and bring up our next speaker, who is Fernando. We're a little bit over time, but that's okay because that's why we put some breaks into the schedule. Thanks, Richard, so much for being here with the release party, and we will see you around in the event chat. No worries. Thanks all.